Lester Raymond Jones Jr. was born in 1983 and went by his initials LJ. He was described as very smart, well-mannered, and caring. At the age of 26, he was a graduate student majoring in biomedical engineering at Mississippi State University and a member of the Omega Pi Phi fraternity. He lived with a roommate on College View Street in Starkville, Mississippi, and was scheduled to graduate with his master's degree within a few months. On January 11, 2010, he was on his way to Jackson when he stopped at his family's house in Tupelo, Mississippi for a brief visit. When he left their home, he had plans to meet up with some friends and fraternity brothers in Jackson, two and a half hours from Tupelo. He was driving his 2002 Blue Ford Expedition with license plate number KTW714. At 10.18 p.m., surveillance cameras at a Sprint Mart service station captured him on video. While at the gas station in Flowood, Mississippi, he used the men's restroom. A customer would later find his cell phone in the restroom and gave it to the store employee. Flowood is only about 15 minutes from where he was heading that day. However, he never arrived to meet his friends, and neither he or his vehicle have ever been seen again. His family reported him missing nine days later. If he was traveling on Old Brandon Road, his vehicle could have gone off into the backwater of Pearl River, located right off the roadway. Did he suddenly realize his phone wasn't with him, and while searching for it, ran off the road into the water, or try to do a U-turn and end up in the water? It doesn't appear that there have been any water searches for his vehicle. Definitely seems like a case that Adventures with Purpose could check out. His mother believes that foul play is involved. She stated that the frat brother that LJ was supposed to visit claimed in two interviews with police that he did not speak on the phone with LJ the evening he disappeared. However, LJ's cell phone records showed that the two actually spoke for about eight minutes that evening. In the third interview with police, he acknowledged that he did speak to him that evening, but it's unclear why he wasn't truthful the first two times. LJ has never been found, and as of April 2022, this case remains unsolved. Haley Ann Marie Cummings was born in 2003 to parents Ronald Cummings and Crystal Sheffield. Haley was born with a genetic disorder known as Turner Syndrome and required frequent hormone medication and medical intervention. Her parents never married and fought over custody of Haley and her younger brother, Junior, who also had medical issues. Due to her mother's use of hard drugs and Haley missing about a dozen important doctor's appointments by the age of two related to her disability, Ronald was granted full custody of both children in 2005, with their mother getting visitation every other weekend. She admitted to using drugs, but said it was at the insistence of Ronald. She also alleged that Ronald was violent and had once tried to get a restraining order against him, but the case was dismissed. At the time, he had a history of drug arrest and had been arrested in 2001 for threatening to kill someone. In 2002, 2004, and 2005, he was arrested for drug possession, but the magistrate stated that he was employed, which was better than Crystal being unemployed. When Haley was just a toddler, she was found unresponsive, face down in a water-filled ditch. She was rescued, and the Department of Children and Families opened a case on her and her brother. When Haley was five years old and Junior was three, they lived with their father in a trailer in the 200 block of Green Lane in the area of Hermit's Cove in Satsuma, Florida, along with Ronald's 17-year-old girlfriend, Misty, also an alleged drug user. On February 9, 2009, Misty returned from a weekend bender just in time for Ronald to go to work and her to babysit the kids. While he was at work, Misty said that the kids went to sleep on their smaller mattress in Ronald and Misty's room. A couple hours later, Misty joined them in the room and went to sleep on the bigger mattress. When Ronald came home at 3.27 a.m. from working the second shift at Palatka Steel Fabricating Plant, Misty told him that she had just discovered that Haley was missing from her mattress. Misty said she woke up a little before 3 a.m. to use the bathroom and noticed the kitchen light on and the side door open. She couldn't explain why she went to use the guest bathroom and not the bathroom in the room where she was sleeping. 
She said the screen door was propped open with a cinder block, and when she returned to the bedroom, she noticed Haley wasn't in the room. She called police as soon as Ronald drove up from work, stating that she waited the 30 minutes because she was looking for her. During the 911 call, Ronald can be heard in the background yelling explicitly. I just woke up and our back door was wide open and we can't find our daughter. Can't find what? Our daughter. Okay, what's your address? Um, green What is the miracle? What's the numerical? Yeah, miracle, what's that? The, the number? Green Lane? Yes. Okay, when did you last see her? Um, we were just like, you know, it was about... Okay, how old is your daughter? She's five. Okay, well, we see what last thing wearing. Ma'am? She was in her pajamas. We were sleeping. Okay, all right. You said your back door was wide open? Yeah, it was brick. Like, it was brick on the floor. Like, when I was asleep, the door was not like that. Okay, the back it's door... Locked. Listen to me. Your back door was wide open. What are you talking about, a brick? Yes. What, what is the brick? It's on the back door on the, on the stairs. Like, we have, like, a walkway. Uh-huh. And there was a brick laying there? Yes, it's still there. Oh, no. we, we got them coming. Tell them we got them coming. They're coming. Yeah, I need somebody to get here. Coming. Okay, let me speak to him. So he... Yeah, 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 yeah. I just got home from work. My five-year-old daughter is gone. I okay. need somebody to be here now. I'm listen telling to me. you. Listen to me. We got two officers. If I find whoever has my daughter before y'all do, I'm killing them. I don't care. Uh, okay, I'm going to rest okay. my life in prison. I'm telling you. You can put it on record and I don't care. Okay, it's okay, sir. We got him on the way. Okay, can you give me any, what kind of description of her pajamas that she was wearing? Okay, sir, we got him coming, okay? When police arrived, they found no sign of forced entry to the trailer, and Ronald said before he went to work, the side door was locked securely. Canine dogs began searching for Haley's scent. The mobile home was in a secluded area, therefore it wasn't believed to be a random abduction, and Ronald didn't believe Haley would walk off on her own as she was very afraid of the dark. Helicopters were brought in, along with divers, and people also rode on horseback through thick rural shrub. Haley's three-year-old brother, Jr., told investigators that a man dressed in black had come to their home that night and taken his sister, but they weren't sure if this was true because of his age. Misty told police that Haley was last seen wearing a pink Hannah Montana shirt and underwear, but that shirt was later found in piles of laundry on the floor. During the extensive search, no sign of Haley was found. A month later, Ronald and Misty got married, and after six months of marriage, Ronald filed for a divorce. Police repeatedly questioned Misty about Haley's disappearance and received an anonymous tip that she wasn't even at the trailer when Haley went missing. Misty said she had been home the entire night and hadn't left the children alone. Investigators have been publicly skeptical of Misty's story, stating she failed four polygraphs and one boy stress test and changed her story multiple times, although Misty lied in an interview and stated that she had passed the polygraph. Misty and her brother Tommy later accused their cousin Joe Overstreet of kidnapping Haley. Overstreet was in Florida from Tennessee and was visiting at the time. Misty failed to initially tell police that he and her brother had been at the home that night. The two men were gone when police arrived to the home and Overstreet returned to Tennessee the next day. Misty stated that Overstreet had sexually abused her when she was a child. Misty's brother Tommy stated that Overstreet kidnapped Haley and the two drove to the St. John's River five miles from Haley's home, and Overstreet threw her in the water in a black bag. He said that he went with Overstreet to the river because he threatened to kill him if he didn't. He said Haley's lifeless body was in the back seat, and once they arrived, Overstreet took her to the end of the dock at the St. John's River and returned without her. Misty later said that this was true and that she had lied earlier because she was afraid of her cousin and hid under the covers when they took Haley. She said her cousin Overstreet killed Haley because he couldn't find Ronald's machine gun that he came looking for, so she was a substitute. 
However, Overstreet denies any involvement in Haley's disappearance, and he hasn't been charged in connection with it or even named as a suspect, although he has been interviewed. Authorities searched the river in April 2010 and brought Misty to the dock, but the search yielded nothing of interest. Another anonymous tip came into police stating that Misty wasn't home that night, but this time it was said that she had brought Haley to a house party with her. It was said that Haley had got a hold of drugs and overdosed, and the men got rid of her body. Some speculate that this could actually be the true story. A lot of both families' crimes and secrets were revealed after Haley's disappearance. After she went missing, Misty's father, Hank Crossland Sr., filed a sheriff's office report saying that the drugs he bought from Ronald nearly killed him. At one point, Ronald was arrested for assaulting Misty's brother and father. For over a month after Haley went missing, investigators conducted an undercover operation. In January 2010, authorities arrested Misty, her brother Tommy, Ronald, and his cousin, and a friend of Misty's after an undercover officer bought more than 300 pills from them on seven different occasions. Misty's parents were also jailed on drug charges unrelated to their children's drug case in the summer of 2010, so the apple didn't fall far from the tree. Misty was sentenced to 25 years in prison, and Ronald and the others were sentenced to 15 years. Haley has never been found, and as of April 2022, this case remains unsolved. Rebecca Grace Barsotti was born in 1988 to parents Angela Mastrovito and Ralph Rose. She was originally from Partlow, Virginia, but then moved to Montana at the age of 18 following a trip to the area with a friend where she fell in love with Montana. She then met David Barsotti and the couple married in 2015, but their marriage eventually fell apart and the couple separated in April 2021. Rebecca had called 911 weeks earlier on March 9th to report domestic violence. She said he had threatened to shoot her hands off, and when police arrived, he was in the bedroom stating that he needed to lock up the dogs. When police came in, he was in bed fully clothed. He was then searched by police and was found with handcuffs in his pockets along with an empty gun holster and multiple guns nearby. He was taken to jail, but found not guilty the next day of domestic violence for this particular incident. She began filming everything she did, and here is a video of her finding a gun in the bed after David was arrested, which explained the empty holster he had on him. So I guess I have to start fucking recording everything now. I was remaking the bed so that I can go to sleep, and this handgun right here was about right there. That little indent, you can still kind of see it right in there. Yeah. So that was in the bed. And I don't know if Dave took that off before, after, or during the copying here. I have no clue. According to her family, David had been abusive to her, which led to her filing for divorce. She eventually moved out with her dog, Cerberus, a Belgian Malinois who was trained to protect her. 
After the separation, Rebecca and Cerberus moved from Superior to Missoula into a home on Mullen Road. On July 20, 2021, Rebecca drove to the Town Pump gas station in Superior around 2.15 p.m. to meet David's caretaker, who was acting as an intermediary, to get the rest of her belongings from the home that she had shared with him. Due to the assault charges against him, the two had a standing order of no contact in place and were legally prohibited from meeting in person. She then drove to Alberton and parked her car at a truck stop and rest area by mile marker 71 on Interstate 90. Afterward, she headed to the Clark Fork River for a hike with Cerberus. Later that day, a family called police when they came upon Rebecca's cell phone, driver's license, credit card, car keys, a dog leash, and the remote to her dog's e-collar on the shore of Clark Fork River east of Alberton Rock. Rebecca never returned home that day and has never been heard from again. Six days after her belongings were found, the body of Cerberus was found in the Clark Fork River, about 10 miles downstream from mile marker 72, and authorities believe he likely drowned. An extensive search of the area was conducted with the help of search and rescue teams, divers, and volunteers from Missoula and Mineral, but turned up no signs of Rebecca. Police found no evidence of foul play in her disappearance and suspect that she drowned in the Clark Fork River after jumping in to save her dog. Mineral County Sheriff's Office believes Cerberus got caught in a current and panicked and Rebecca went in to help and also got caught in the current and drowned. Later, video was found on Rebecca's phone of her training Cerberus at the river the day she disappeared. The last ping on Rebecca's phone was at 3.15. According to her family, the scene where her belongings were found on the riverbank was never secured, fingerprints were never taken from her personal items or from her vehicle, and scent dogs were never brought in to determine if Rebecca in fact went into the river. There's also the fact that nobody saw Rebecca go into the river. According to the sheriff deputy, it was always considered a river accident and not a crime. The river was dangerous to enter as it was cold with heavy currents. Her belongings and vehicle are supposedly still in possession of police. Police said they have ruled out David as a suspect and there has been no reliable information leading to foul play and he had an alibi. Rebecca's mother believes that she may have met with foul play at the hands of her estranged husband and the scene was staged and authorities have been looking in the wrong place. David allegedly threatened to drown Rebecca and the dog two weeks earlier on text messages sent to Rebecca's mother. He was scheduled to go to court two months after Rebecca's disappearance for a charge of assault on Rebecca. Rebecca's mother and stepfather moved from Virginia to Missoula to be near the investigation and moved into the trailer that Rebecca had recently rented. However, the landlord received multiple harassing and threatening phone calls from David, ordering the landlord to evict them from the property, stating that since the two weren't yet officially divorced, that he was her next of kin. He also had a lawyer get an order for him to be given all her belongings from the property. Her mother and stepfather hired a private company in early March 2022, Wings of Hope Response Team, to search for her along with a private investigator. The search and rescue team completed a 31-day search for Rebecca in early April 2022. They have had a team of volunteers using state-of-the-art drones, sonar, and cadaver dogs. Scuba divers and local river guides donated their time and equipment as well, but sadly, Rebecca hasn't been found. The private investigator has reported back that David allegedly stated that Rebecca wouldn't be found. He also reported back that on the day of the disappearance, a witness had seen three people in a raft with one of the persons lying down while Rebecca's dog appeared frantic while chasing after the raft and barking on the riverbank. Some speculate that this could have been David and his caretaker slash friend with Rebecca, the one lying down, possibly at gunpoint. This particular female caretaker has been accused of saying horrible and insensitive things to Rebecca's family after her disappearance. David's wife before Rebecca allegedly told police that David had also been physically and abusive to her as well, which led to their divorce and she remains fearful of him. 
David has also claimed to have been in the special ops in the Marines and injured during war and participated in several top secret operations. However, resources say that he was injured in Marine boot camp and was quickly discharged and never even completed boot camp and is described as a pathological liar. He claims to be retired from the Marines and fabricates a humanitarian effort called the Orphan's Thanksgiving for service members with no one to share Thanksgiving with or who weren't allowed to leave base to go home for the holiday. It has taken place at Bootlegger's Bar in conjunction with the owner of the bar. Rebecca is one of many cases that were glossed over in the media during the Gabby Petito surge and is currently considered inactive. Here is a video of Rebecca recording the new trailer she found to rent for her and Cerberus after leaving David. Very long, but... Got the washer, got stuff for storage, and then maybe even got some place for my broom, so it's out of the way. Bathroom, it's actually real tile, it's not fake, like I thought it might be. And then I think that's just linoleum, but lots of storage in the bathroom, which is awesome. I need some more to put all my shit. And then tiny little hallway. But got the kitchen. They've got more storage in here. So they've got shelves. Beautiful view of the fence. But that's alright. Sink, oven, and then a little living room. But all new windows in Montana. That is huge. And I'll probably end up frosting this for privacy, even though you can see the mountains kind of from my porch. And then this is the door that I'm afraid Cerberus is gonna like break through, but I can frost that as well. And then I've got a deck and I've got outdoor storage in that thing. This thing has like shelves in it. And then got a yard for Sir, so that he can actually go tinkle and go chill and not be on the concrete. So that's my home. Do you think Rebecca drowned that day or do you think she met with foul play? Margie Ann Ranshaw was born in 1958 at the age of 29, she had a daughter named Ashley Copeland. Margie and Ashley were living with Margie's parents in Barryton, Michigan, a small village east of Big Rapids. On May 17, 1987, when Ashley was only two months old, Margie left home to go get a gallon of milk but never returned. Margie suffered from schizophrenia and prior to going missing, told her father that the voices were telling her to leave. He told her to fight through the voices and try to ignore them. She would often hitchhike and be gone for months at a time, but always came back. But this time was different. Police found her car abandoned two weeks later, two hours away at a hotel in Howell, Michigan, off Interstate 96. However, Margie has never been found. Her daughter Ashley would later be adopted and raised by her aunt and uncle. When Ashley grew up, she began a search for her mother utilizing background searches and online searches, hoping that she was still alive, but everything led to a dead end. Even today, she is hoping that recent advances in genetic genealogy can help her find out if her mother is a Jane Doe and bring her home. On June 16, 1987, a woman's body was found a month after Margie went missing. The body was found in Toledo, Ohio, in an alley behind an auto repair shop near Collingwood Boulevard and Detroit Avenue, close to Interstate 75. The victim had been deceased for several days and the remains were charred. Authorities believe she died of a cocaine overdose and was dumped there but haven't ruled out homicide either. She became known as Lucas County Jane Doe when she could not be identified. 52 women have been ruled out as being the decedent, but it's unclear if Margie has been ruled out as being the Lucas County Jane Doe, but a tip has been sent in suggesting this. However, as of April 2022, this case remains unsolved.
and Alicia Maria Cruz was born December 19, 1993, and lived in the remote area of Chiloquin, Oregon. On July 9, 1994, seven-month-old Annalisha went missing under suspicious circumstances while with her mom's live-in boyfriend, William Russell Spear. His story goes that he took her with him when he went on a fishing trip that day and was babysitting her while her mother went to a doctor's appointment. After he finished fishing, he drove with Annalisha to Clyde's Market and left her in the car for a few minutes while he stepped inside to buy an apple. He says when he came out, she was gone. Instead of calling authorities, he left the store and drove home. Once there, he asked Annalisha's mother, Alice Fowler, if she had taken the baby. They went back to Clyde's Market, looked around for Annalisha, and asked people if they had seen her. They then reported her missing. Spear did stop at a Sprague River gas station before his fishing trip, and the attendant remembered hearing an infant crying in the car. This is the last time anyone besides Spear could confirm Annalisha's whereabouts. Over the years, there have been several age progression photographs created and released showing what she may look like through ages 7 to 19. She also had a red birthmark on her neck. Her mother later sued Spear for $4 million for his negligence causing her disappearance, but the lawsuit was dismissed for lack of evidence. She was counseled to sue him in an attempt to get on record that her death had actually occurred. Many reports say that Annalisha was not put in a car seat that day, but instead was placed in a backpack in the car. Her mother has stated that this is incorrect and she was in a car seat. Spear has since continued to have a reputation as being both physically and emotionally abusive to people in his life and was accused in the mysterious death of a woman while the two were camping several years after Annalisha's disappearance, but again he wasn't charged due to lack of evidence. Spear is considered a person of interest in Annalisha's case, but investigators can find no evidence of any crime, and as of April 2022, this case remains unsolved. <laughs>